Hi everyone, this lecture is the introduction to the pulmonology unit and respiratory anatomy. We will identify and describe the structures of the upper and lower respiratory tract, starting at the nasal cavity and ending down in the air sacs of the lungs, the alveoli. We will talk about the protective mechanisms in place to provide immune defense of the airways, and especially talk about the structure of the alveoli and the structure and function of the respiratory membrane. We will finish up by talking about the membrane around the lungs and how it's innervated. The respiratory system supplies the body with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. In order to do that, it has to perform ventilation, which is bringing air into the body. It has to filter, humidify, and warm that inspired air. And then it has to do gas exchange. Gas exchange is the process of respiration. This is normally just oxygen and carbon dioxide gas exchange. And for respiration, we include gas exchange between the external environment and the lungs, and then the blood and the tissues. During gas exchange regulation, the respiratory system also maintains pH homeostasis by regulating carbon dioxide. During the movement of air or ventilation, we can also use that movement of air to produce sound and to bring in smells from the environment, which is olfactory sensation. So there's multiple processes that must happen to supply the body with oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. We will discuss ventilation and gas transport, talking about the details of diffusion, both between the lungs and the blood and the blood and the tissues. This all requires coordination of respiratory and cardiovascular systems, the respiratory for the diffusion of gases and the cardiovascular system for the perfusion of blood. Clinically, we distinguish the upper and lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract includes the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the portion of the larynx that is just above the vocal cords. Below the vocal cords is where the lower respiratory tract begins, and that includes the portion of the larynx below the vocal cords, the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. We can also distinguish functional divisions within the respiratory system. Typically, we refer to the conducting zone as the area where air is moving from the external environment down into the lungs. And this is from the nasal cavity all the way to the terminal bronchioles or the small branches of bronchioles that don't contain alveoli. As soon as we see alveoli, the air sacs of the lungs, this is where we have gas exchange, and that's where the respiratory zone begins when we're distinguishing between conducting of air and diffusion of gases or respiration. As the air is moving through the respiratory tract, it is filtered, moistened, and warmed by the mucosa of the respiratory tract. The respiratory mucosa is called a mucosa because it contains a lot of mucus. Mucus traps bacteria and foreign debris and also moistens the air. Within this respiratory mucosa, the tissue type is the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. That tissue is pictured over here in this diagram, which you can see the columnar shape of the cells interspersed with goblet cells. The goblet cells are those mucus producing cells. Notice that even though it looks like multiple layers, it's only a single layer of epithelium, and that's why it's called pseudo-stratified, because it's not really layered. It's just a single layer in different directions that looks like multiple layers. There's also cilia in the respiratory tract, and these cilia are structures or projections from the epithelium that are very important for sweeping debris up and out of the airways. So as that mucus is being produced and we form a mucus and a water layer above that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, the mucus and water layers allow the movement of debris and foreign particles by the cilia as they sweep 
to move that debris up and out of the airways. In addition, there's a network of blood vessels that warms the passing air as it's moving through the respiratory mucosa. There are many clinical examples of the importance of cilia and the mucosa. For example, a smoker's cough. Smoking paralyzes and ultimately damages the cilia, and that leads to increased particles in the airways. When we have a high amount of debris and mucus building up in the airways, we have a higher possibility of infection and pathogens growing within the respiratory mucosa. So we have pulmonary defense mechanisms. The respiratory system is open to the air, and therefore it needs protection from contaminants, debris, bacteria, etc. all of these things in the external environment. As we said, the function of the mucosa with the mucus and the cilia is to help to trap and remove this debris. We also have other defense mechanisms. For example, the nasal cavity contains small hairs within the vestibule or the opening of the nasal cavity. That can help to trap and remove debris as well. Further down in the respiratory tract, we have irritant receptors. These can trigger the cough reflex to propel substances out. We also know we have the sneeze reflex up in the nasal cavity. So debris and irritants that enter into the respiratory passages can trigger these sneeze and cough reflexes to help to forcibly propel these substances out. Down further into the air sacs, if any debris or pathogens enter the air sacs way deep down in the lungs, we have alveolar macrophages, which can ingest and remove debris and bacteria. We also have surfactant. Surfactant is very important. Later on, we'll talk about the role of surfactant in surface tension. But surfactant can also help to downregulate inflammation by enhancing phagocytosis by the macrophages. All of these processes form part of this innate defense or immune defense for the respiratory passages that are open to the environment. So we're gonna work our way through the upper and lower respiratory tract, and I'm gonna point out a few pieces of the important anatomy here. So starting at the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is up in the nose, where the air enters the nose through the external and internal nares. The external nares are the openings to the outside. The internal nares are the openings to the next part of the passageway, the pharynx. Between the right and left sides of the nasal cavity, we have a nasal septum. This divides that cavity, and it's a bony and also a cartilaginous septum. Along the nasal septum, we also have the nasal conchi, also referred to as the nasal turbinates. That's these ridges that you see along either side of the septum. We have superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi that are formed by bone covered in mucosa. This increases the turbulence of the inspired air and increases the exposure of the air to the respiratory mucosa, part of that defense, but also part of warming and moistening the air before it gets down into the lungs. The boundaries of the nasal cavity are the hard and soft palate inferiorly and the sphenoid and ethmoid bones superiorly. Part of the openings in the skull and open to the nasal cavity are the sinuses. Sinuses are openings within the skull bones that produce mucus and resonate sound. They also function to lighten the skull. The sinuses are named for the bones in which they lie. So the frontal sinuses are within the frontal bone. The maxillary sinuses are on either side within the maxilla. The sphenoid sinuses are up in the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid sinuses, also known as the ethmoid air cells, are up within the ethmoid bone. Moving past the nasal cavity, we enter into the throat, or the pharynx. There's three regions of the pharynx. The nasopharynx, just behind the nasal cavity, the oropharynx, just behind the mouth or the oral cavity, and the laryngopharynx, which is just above the larynx. So the nasopharynx is up here, very close to the end of the soft palate or the uvula. 
The uvula is the portion of the soft palate that will close off the nasal cavity during swallowing. That prevents substances from entering the nasal cavity. Within the nasopharynx, you will also see the pharyngeal tonsil on the posterior wall. And you will also see the opening to the auditory tube, also known as the eustachian tube. Further down within the oropharynx, you will see the palatine tonsils on either side of the palate in the back of the mouth. And at the base of the tongue, you will see the lingual tonsil. These are lymphatic tissue that can swell during infection. The last portion is the laryngopharynx. This is the portion that will ultimately split to form the esophagus posteriorly and the larynx anteriorly. We can find the laryngopharynx by looking for the epiglottis, which is the top of the larynx. The epiglottis will close off the larynx or close off the opening to the airway during swallowing to prevent food from entering the airway. When we find the epiglottis, we have now begun the portion of the larynx. The larynx is also referred to as the voice box. The larynx produces sound and prevents food from entering the respiratory passages lower down, starting with the trachea. There are many muscles that move the larynx, controlling the vocal cords and also contributing to swallowing and respiration, preventing aspiration or movement of food into the lower respiratory tract. The larynx is surrounded by many cartilaginous structures. These cartilage pieces are protective and rigid and prevent collapse of the airway. The epiglottis is here and closes off the top of the larynx. The other cartilages form around the larynx, the largest of those cartilages being the thyroid cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is not where you will find your thyroid. If you start talking and you can feel around your larynx, you'll feel the vibration in the large cartilage, which is where we find our Adam's apple. So if you find your Adam's apple much more prominent in men, then you're actually touching your thyroid cartilage. It's named thyroid because it's shield shaped, not because it's where the thyroid gland is. We have to move much further down to find the location of the thyroid gland, which is also shield shaped. So they're named for their shape, not for their association with each other. The epiglottis is very important. It's this spoon-shaped elastic cartilage flap that projects from the anterior portion of the larynx over the opening to the, the vocal cords or over the glottis. You can see in this picture that we're showing how the epiglottis closes when a food bolus is being swallowed. So here the epiglottis is closed over the airway and that prevents aspiration and choking food from getting down into the airway. It moves downward and forms a lid over the glottis during swallowing. The epiglottis is an important structure to know when you're learning about respiratory infections. So there are certain respiratory infections that can lead to epiglottitis or inflammation and swelling of the epiglottis. In this case, you will learn how to very, very carefully examine these patients, particularly children with epiglottitis, because disruption of the epiglottis when it is inflamed or swollen can actually further close the airway, and closure of the airway will lead to a medical emergency because the patient will not be able to breathe. So we're very, very careful when we're examining the throat if we are concerned for epiglottitis because we don't want to further irritate the epiglottis and lead to closure of the airway. You will learn about this later in your clinical skills and medicine courses. Let's look more closely at the vocal cords as well. The vocal cords are found within the larynx. We have two types of vocal cords. The vestibular folds are referred to as the false vocal cords. These are the pinkish looking areas that are covered in mucosa. 
The vestibular folds are very, very sensitive. They will provoke a coughing reflex if any sort of debris touches this portion of the vocal cords. That leads to ejection of anything that may enter the larynx. They're not involved in sound production though, but they are protective because of this irritant reflex. The true vocal cords are the structures you're seeing that look white. These are elastic like ligaments that are attached to two parts of cartilage within the larynx, the arachnoid and the thyroid cartilage. They vibrate and produce sound as the air is expelled from the lungs. So we use these true vocal cords to make different sounds. Inflammation of the vocal cords, changes in muscles that can cause the closure of the vocal cords, can lead to a scratchy or hoarse voice. And you will learn about this as a sign of certain medical conditions. The glottis is the opening between the vocal cords. It's simply the space when the vocal cords are open. Next, underneath the larynx, we get to the trachea or the windpipe. The trachea is what you're feeling when you're feeling this cartilaginous structure all down the front of your neck. It's in front of the esophagus and extends from the larynx to approximately the T5 level. It divides into the right and left primary bronchi that will enter into the lungs. The trachea is lined with respiratory mucosa. It has C-shaped hyaline cartilage rings that are protective as they can prevent the air from causing collapse of the airway. They're C-shaped because they allow some expansion in the back as food is being swallowed down the esophagus. We need some flexibility in the trachea to allow food, the food bolus to pass through. So as the trachea moves down and branches into the primary bronchi towards the lungs, we are now entering the thoracic cavity and the pleural cavities holding the lungs. The thoracic cavity is bound by the rib cage, the sternum, and the thoracic vertebrae posteriorly. It's separated from the abdominal cavity by the large muscle of the diaphragm. It's divided into the right and left pleural cavities, which each independently contain the right and the left lung, and also the mediastinum, which contains the heart and several other organs. We talked about the mediastinum in the heart lecture. When we look at the location of the lungs, you will notice that we have different landmarks within the body to be able to listen to the lungs. The apex, or the top of the lungs, is found just above the clavicle. And so it's important to make sure as you're listening to the lungs that you go all the way up towards the neck. The base of the lungs is found around the sixth rib anteriorly, and the eighth rib at the mid-axillary line and approximately T10 posteriorly. So it's also important as you're listening, particularly on the back, to go all the way down the ribs to fully get the apex and the base of the lungs. The lungs will ascend and descend with the diaphragm during inspiration and expiration. This is a summary of lung position in the chest wall that you may want to keep for later when you're learning your physical exam. The pleura are the membranes surrounding the lungs. Each lung is surrounded by its own pleural membrane, and the pleural membrane has two layers. The parietal pleura is the lining of the walls of the thoracic cavity. Then we have pleural fluid, which is between the, the parietal pleura, and then the next layer, the visceral pleura. The visceral pleura covers the surface of the lungs. The pleural fluid is an important thin layer of fluid that lubricates these two surfaces to prevent friction as the lungs are moving up and down during inspiration and expiration, and it also creates surface tension that keeps the lungs coupled to the chest wall. Here's a diagram of the pleura. On the left side of this diagram, you can see the parietal pleura along the chest wall, 
along the diaphragm and along the mediastinum, and the visceral pleura along the outside of the lungs. The picture on the left side shows what happens if you disrupt the surface tension between the parietal and visceral pleura, um, and in the extreme case, you have collapse of the lung. So let's talk about the sensory innervation of the pleura. The parietal pleura has sensation of pain in response to injury or inflammation but the visceral pleura and the lung tissue does not. Injury or inflammation to the mediastinal and diaphragmatic portions of the pleura will go to the phrenic nerve, and this will refer pain to the C3, 4, 5 regions we talked about when we talked about the phrenic nerve innervation. Remember the three Ps of the phrenic nerve. This is referred pain to the neck and shoulder from the pericardium, the parietal pleura, and the diaphragmatic peritoneum. This is important to understand because shoulder pain can often be referred pain from the phrenic nerve and not necessarily a musculoskeletal issue. So if you have a patient with shoulder pain and you've checked out all of the musculoskeletal potential causes, you want to think about the potential for referred pain from these organs. The parietal pleura also has innervation by the intercostal nerves, and this can lead to a more rib-like stabbing pain or associated pain along the intercostal nerves associated with that region of the pleura. As we said, visceral pleura does not have pain or general sensory um, innervation, but it does have autonomic innervation. So the lung tissue and the visceral pleura have both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation, and that leads to the autonomic reflexes and control of ventilation. Now let's get down into the lungs. The lungs are large, spongy organs composed mostly of elastic connective tissue, but also the airways and the alveoli. They're found in the thoracic cavity within the right and left pleural cavities, and they're oriented with the apex at the superior portion and the base along the diaphragm. Each lung is divided into lobes. The right lung has three lobes, the superior, the middle, and the inferior lobes. These lobes are physically separated by large fissures or separations. The superior and inferior lobes are separated by the oblique fissure. The superior and middle lobes of the right lung are separated by the horizontal fissure. The left lung only has two lobes, just the superior and inferior lobes separated again by the oblique fissure. The reason that the left lung only has two lobes is because the left lung is a little bit smaller to allow room for the heart. Remember that the heart is tilted slightly towards the left, and you can actually see that space for the heart because there's a notch out of the left lung where the heart sits, which is called the cardiac notch. As we move from the trachea into the lungs, the trachea branches into the left and right primary bronchi. The left bronchus enters the left portion of the lung at the hilum. The right primary bronchus enters the right portion of the lung at the right hilum. Notice that they have slightly different angles. The left primary bronchus is curved and broad, approximately a 45 degree angle. The right primary bronchus is steep and wider, approximately 20 or 30 degree angle. Why do we care about this? We care about this because if you're thinking about aspiration or foreign bodies entering the lungs through the trachea, it is the right side of the lung that is more likely to be the site of foreign body aspiration. And that's because it is wider and at a steeper angle. The primary bronchi are the first branches from the trachea. 
each primary bronchus then sends out a lobar bronchus, which is that secondary bronchus. So how many lobar or secondary bronchi will we have on the right side? Three, because we have three lobes of the right lung. How many secondary or lobar bronchi will we have on the left side? Two, because we have two lobes of the left lung. After that, the bronchi branch into segmental bronchi, supplying different bronchopulmonary segments within the lungs. Notice that at this level, the bronchi contain cartilage. And as the bronchi branch into smaller and smaller bronchioles, the cartilage goes away. So looking at the bronchioles, the smaller and smaller bronchioles are made up of smooth muscle and connective tissue, and they're lined by the respiratory mucosa. The terminal bronchioles are the final smallest branch of the bronchioles before we enter into the region that contains alveoli or air sacs. The cilia and the goblet cells become more and more sparse and the smooth muscle and connective tissue gets thinner and thinner as the airways get smaller and smaller. The most important part of the lungs are the alveoli. These are the tiny air sacs that are the sites of gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. This we now call the respiratory zone because this is where gas exchange will begin. Notice how the alveoli are absolutely covered in pulmonary capillaries. If we look at a histological section, we can see the very, very thin rings of the alveoli and they're made up of simple squamous epithelium, the thinnest possible epithelial layers. We can also see in this histological section a cross section of a larger bronchial with some cartilage and the smooth muscle and epithelium of the bronchial and a cross section of a large bronchus with a large portion of cartilage there as well. Let's look more closely at the alveolar wall. We have type 1 alveolar cells, also called pneumocytes, that are simple squamous epithelium supported by an elastic basement membrane. These type 1 alveolar cells are drawn here, making up the wall of the alveoli. There are also type 2 alveolar cells. The type 2 alveolar cells secrete a group of molecules collectively known together as surfactant. Surfactant is a group of lipoproteins. Here's the type 1 alveolar cell drawn in blue and its surfactant also drawn in blue lining the inside of the alveoli. Surfactant is made up primarily of lipoproteins. It coats the alveoli to reduce surface tension to prevent collapse of the alveoli. It also binds to pathogens and contributes to control of inflammation and immunity. Surfactant is a very important molecule because without surfactant, it's very difficult to inflate the alveoli. Think of trying to blow up a bubble. What do you need to add to bubble solution? Let's say you're in the shower and you're trying to blow bubbles. My kids do this all the time. They're trying to blow bubbles with, through their hands, right? What do you need to do? Can you just blow a bubble with water? You can't. The surface tension is too high. But if you add some soap, some lipids to that, and you mix it up within the water, you redu reduce the surface tension of that water, and then you can open up and blow a nice bubble with that. That's exactly what the surfactant is doing. It's reducing that surface tension to allow these air sacs to open up more easily. Also within the alveolar wall are the alveolar macrophages. These are also called dust cells. They engulf debris and prepare it for removal through the lymph nodes nearby. These are important if any pathogens and debris are able to make it down into these tiny airways. There are two major blood supplies to the lungs. 
the pulmonary arteries branch into the pulmonary capillaries that are surrounding the alveolar sacs. And these are going to be the portions of blood supply that are providing the major site of gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. That oxygenated blood will then leave the pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart. But the lung tissue itself also needs some blood supply. This is provided in part by the pulmonary arteries and veins, but also by the bronchial circulation. We have a separate set of bronchial arteries and bronchial veins that branch from the aorta and intercostal arteries and then return to the circulation through systemic veins. These have anastomoses with the pulmonary veins and can help to provide blood supply and remove blood from the parenchyma or the cellular tissue portion of the lung. All right, the last thing I wanna make sure we cover in detail is the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane is where the pulmonary capillaries meet the alveoli. So the respiratory membrane is the microscopic space where the alveoli contact the blood capillaries. It's the site of gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood. As we learned for other areas of diffusion, this layer must be very, very thin. So the respiratory membrane is made up of the alveoli, the type 1 cells of the alveoli, forming the wall of the alveoli, a simple squamous layer, a small interstitial space, about a half a micron thick, with a basement membrane, tiny bit of thin connective tissue that fuses the alveoli to the capillaries below. And then we have the capillary wall, which is also made up of a simple squamous epithelium, and this is formed by the lining of the pulmonary capillaries. So here we have the air, a very small layer, and then the blood, and we're able to exchange gases between the air and the blood. Make sure that you can visualize and draw the respiratory membrane. Think about the direction in which the gases should move from the air to the blood, from the blood to the air. And this will be the subject of the following lectures. All right, that's it. Let me know if you have any questions.